What's up NBA fans, Dom2K on the mic, and we're back with part 2 of the what if scenarios that could have completely changed the 2000s. If you didn't see the last one, the link is going to be in the comment section and in the description, and as always, you'll also find the link to the SeatGeek app. SeatGeek pulls tickets from all over the web and has them in one place to make purchase and one for your event really easy, and it also makes sure you'll be getting the best value for your ticket. While searching for your tickets, each one is ranked with a score from 1 to 100 that lets you know if you're getting a good deal or not for your purchase. On top of that, the app also provides you with a detailed view of what you would see from your seat before you even get there which is extremely helpful. If you're interested in downloading this app, the links to it are going to be in the comment section and in the description. If you're still on the fence, consider using my promo code DOM2K to get $20 off your first purchase. And without further ado, let's finish up this list. Williams inside Cruz. Considering that Boozer has basically disappeared from the league by now, and the fact that he had a pretty steep decline after the year 2012 or 13, you might be questioning this one. However, if you watch basketball in the mid to late 2000s at all, you know exactly why this would have been significant. Boozer was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers, but you might not have even noticed it because he only played there for two seasons, and of course, the only thing anyone was paying attention to in Cleveland was LeBron James, pretty much like now. But this one is pretty ridiculous because if you look at his first two years, he showed very good development and was clearly a budding star. That begs the question, why on earth did the Cavs not resign him from his rookie contract? Well, it was a bit of the Cavaliers' fault and a bit of Bruce's side being shady. We all know that when players are on their rookie deal, the option in their contract goes to the team so a rookie can't just blossom into a star and leave the first chance he gets, otherwise it would totally defeat the purpose of the team's drafting to get better. Well, in this case, Boozer and the Cavaliers actually reached a handshake deal for Cleveland to let him out of that option because they trusted him to do the right thing while negotiating the best deal for him and the team. Boozer was saying that he wanted financial security, but he also wanted to be a Cavalier for a very long time, and Cleveland thought they could make that work. Well, in the summer of 2003, just like they agreed, Cleveland let him out of the contract with the understanding that they'd start negotiating the best possible deal as soon as possible. The thing is, no other team in the NBA thought Cleveland would be crazy enough to let a two-year player who was clearly on his way to being a star into the free market. Yet, that's exactly what happened, and when it did, other teams started coming with contract offers better than what Cleveland could offer him. Remember, when a player is shopping for a contract, it's also in his agent's best interest for him to get more money because he gets a cut of that, and other potential clients look at the deals an agent can get for his player. With that being the case, Boozer and company could remain loyal to what they told the Cavaliers and sign a 6 year $40 million contract, or they could take what the Jazz offered at 6 years for $68 million. Taking the Cavs contract would have meant Boozer was signing under market value, and that would have reflected poorly on the agent, so really, everybody on Boozer's side won by taking Utah's offer. And with an extremely stupid move on the Cavaliers part, they lost a future all-star for LeBron James to play with when they really didn't have to. So now we focus on what his departure actually meant and what could have been if he had have stayed. As you saw with his stats, his sophomore season was a breakout year that saw him averaging 16 points and 11 rebounds. He went and spent the rest of the decade in Utah and became one of the better power forwards in the league averaging 19 points, 11 rebounds, and making two all-star teams. The all-star appearances may not sound like much, but how about comparing him to the players LeBron had to deal with up until he left in 2010? You see how this might have made a difference? Also, remember that the West is always stacked and it was probably difficult to make an all-star team over guys like Duncan and Dirk. So, in our original timeline, the one that actually happened, Boozer left Cleveland and the best players LeBron had afterwards were Elgowskis, Mo Williams, and Antoine Jameson. He got the team to a finals in 07 where they were swept, but won 60 games multiple times and always had them in the championship conversation. Of course, the biggest news of the latter half of the 2000s were always about how he just couldn't get them over that hump. Do you think Carlos Boozer could have changed that? He was pretty close to being the ideal big man for LeBron to play with because he had a nice mid-range jump shot like Ogalskis that could spread the floor. So that means along with having a nice big man duo down low, the Cavaliers would have had an all-star 1-2 punch for the rest of the 2000s. 
If you lived through that era watching LeBron, then you remember how incredibly dominant he was and just thinking about how crazy it would have been if he even had one more legit all-star player. In 2007, the year Carlos Boozer made his first all-star team, LeBron made his first finals against the Spurs with no partner in crime to take the pressure off. Not saying the Cavs would have won that series with Boozer, but it gives them a way better chance with another dependable star on the offense. And the outlook on this one is crazy as well. In hindsight, we know that Boozer faded pretty quickly after 2010, but with his play through the 2000s, do you think LeBron would have still felt the need to leave Cleveland the first time? I feel safe betting the Cavs would have made the finals at least once more with Boozer's presence. And we could have definitely have gotten that Kobe and LeBron finals at some point, and probably in 2009 when Kevin Garnett got hurt. Being that the Boozer signing affected LeBron, it affected the entire NBA for years to come. And this is a super underrated what if, because you might not think highly of Boozer, but if he had just stayed in Cleveland, the NBA would look totally different even today. He would join the Mavs along with a 7 foot rookie from Germany, Dirk Nowitzki. I feel like nobody knows Steve Nash before he was leading that explosive offense in Phoenix, and I kind of get it because his numbers definitely improved under Dan Tony, but he had a nice stretch in Dallas as a two time all star as well. He had a four year stretch of putting up 17 points and 8 assists, shooting 42% from three, and the Mavericks never won less than 52 games during that time either. As a matter of fact, they won 60 games in 2003 and were two wins away from the NBA Finals, just two wins away from playing the New Jersey Nets where I'm betting they would have won. Despite their success, when Nash was up for free agency, Mark Cuban declined to match the Suns' offer, officially letting one of the best point guards ever walk for absolutely nothing. The worst part about this was that Nash didn't even really want to leave the Mavericks, but somehow Cuban didn't think that keeping him and the whiskey together could have somehow worked out sooner than later. The official reason you'll find was that Nash was pretty injury prone in his first few years with the Mavericks and Cuban was betting that he wouldn't stay healthy long term so he wasn't worth the money. Even that doesn't totally make sense when you consider he'd strung together about 3 or 4 healthy seasons before the contract issue. Nonetheless, he became a member of the Suns, won consecutive MVPs, and consistently had Phoenix in the running for a championship. But what if he had been able to put those efforts towards the Mavericks offense with Dirk Nowitzki for the rest of the 2000s? Remember, Dirk also won an MVP, and this one hurts big time because when you look at Dirk's career, you just get the feeling that he was destined for so much more. Not that he didn't achieve much, because between the MVP, championship and finals MVP, and 30,000 plus points, he did get very far. But with his talent, especially in his prime, most people would agree that multiple championships were in order, and Nash could have helped him do that. Speaking of Nash, he never even made the finals despite the Suns always being in the conversation. Their all offense, no defense approach never quite cut it. Meanwhile, the Mavericks were a consistent top 10 defensive team for a few years after letting Nash go. So when you look at Dirk who came within 2 wins of a title in 06 and won 60 games the next year with no Steve Nash, I'm gonna say they get at least one title in the 2000s with Nash and probably another finals appearance. Of course, this means the run and gun Suns never happened and they were a fan favorite throughout that era, so it's probably personal preference as to whether this makes the 2000s better or not. But considering that Sotomayor had a couple of injury riddled seasons with Nash, I would have rather have seen him playing with Dirk for the rest of the 2000s. The celebrating Lakers, Allen Iverson with another gutsy effort playing with the Brewers ribs. You all laugh at the Pistons for messing up the 03 draft, but the Sixers taking Larry Hughes over Dirk might have been the biggest mistake of the decade. True, Dirk Nowitzki did struggle for his rookie season, but that's literally the only time he struggled for the rest of his career up until now where he's just old and really shouldn't be on the court anymore. That one hurts pretty badly because when talking about Allen Iverson's career, one thing comes up. That 2001 team that he somehow got to the finals and even won a game with against the Lakers. So let's take a look at 2001. Here, Dirk was in just his third season already averaging 22 points, 9 rebounds, 1.2 blocks, and shooting 38% from the 3 as one of the earlier big men to consistently stretch the floor. I will never not feel bad for Allen Iverson, because if he had Dirk to go through the 2000s with, the Sixers could have been a legit threat for about a decade. Of course, many of you are probably already asking the question, would Allen Iverson have been able to coexist with another star at that point in his career? You might think of Iverson as selfish, but in reality, we never saw him paired with any significant talent until he was 31 years old playing with Melo, which wasn't really a great match anyways. Before that, his best teammate was probably a young Andre Iguodala, so how do we know what his game would have looked like if he actually had something consistent to pass to in his prime? 
He averaged 7 assists in his rookie year and 8 assists in 05, so he was clearly capable of sharing some. Also, let's look at the fact that he was playing in the East post Michael Jordan and pre LeBron, which was absolutely terrible. He made the finals once without Dirk, so I'm definitely giving him at least one more in that time with Dirk on the team, and that's being conservative. In fact, with Dirk's consistent improvement throughout that time, we could have easily seen an actual rivalry between LA and Philly the same way it could have happened with the Magic. And then we look later in the 2000s where people forget Iverson was still putting up close to 30 points up until Denver traded him. If we back up just a little bit, does Iverson even get traded from Philly if they have Dirk who was a star player until around 2012 or 2013? Why would they have felt the need to start over with a team that probably would have still been successful and contending at the time? This also opens the door for a legit Eastern rivalry between the Pistons and Sixers because although they only made the finals twice, they were in the conference finals every season up until 08. Dirk in the Eastern Conference would have also been interesting considering the amount of power that was growing in the West for that decade. I'm gonna say this one would have improved the 2000s just because Allen Iverson would have been playing with an MVP and a top 10 scorer in history, and that would have been a headache for any team. And those are the last three what ifs that could have completely changed the 2000s. All of these scenarios to me that I've covered in the last two videos are so interesting because, especially when you account for the butterfly effect, so many different players would be on different teams, history would be completely rewritten, championships would have been redistributed. Honestly, a lot of these scenarios seem like they would have made the 2000s more interesting than they turned out. And like I said, although we remember them as being good, they could have been better. So make sure to leave your thoughts on all these what ifs in the comment section, which ones you like the best, what you think they would have done to the NBA, just any thoughts that you have about them are going to be interesting. Hit the like button, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed, and make sure to sub to my second channel where I'm doing a lot of gaming stuff that I think you would enjoy. Hit the bell next to my name if you want notifications on future videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys on the next one.